Hi, welcome back to my series on Sir and Kierkegaard. Thanks for your patience. I've been doing a lot of other work the past few months. Um, this is close to the end of my lecture series. This lecture is on the ethical phase. The last lecture was on the aesthetic. If you haven't seen that, you can check it out. Um, it'll make this one make more sense, but this should also make some sense by itself. And then I'll have a lecture. The next lecture will be on the religious phase. And then I'll have a final lecture to conclude this eight-part lecture series. And that will also be the premiere of the audio course on Søren Kierkegaard. That is the continuation or the second phase of this course for those who want to go more in-depth. Um, I have a new equipment. This has been part of what I've been doing, re setting up my office. So um, thanks again for your patience. And let me get right into the ethical phase of Søren Kierkegaard. Now, you'll recall from my introductory lecture on the theory of the stages that the theory of the stages is a very difficult thing to describe. And so if you've never heard of it before in terms of Kierkegaard's work, please go back and check out that lecture on the um, theory of stages as a concept and the aesthetic phase. The ethical phase only makes sense in light of this previous material. And what I'm going to try to explain in this brief lecture are three key features of the ethical stage that you need to understand to read Kierkegaard's writings and to understand the role of the ethical stage in the theory of stages. So these three things are each in a way quite controversial, not if you're a Kierkegaard interpreter, but they sound strange as a philosophical claim. So here's the first phase. Um, the first claim is most human beings today are not in the ethical phase, and it's debatable whether Kierkegaard thought most human beings ever were in the ethical phase. Um, however, he definitely thought that the 19th century culture that he lived in saw the sort of triumph or the rise of the aesthetic phase as a very powerful cultural force in society. But Kierkegaard would have also thought the aesthetic phase was part of Greek antiquity, for example, I can't get into that. That's a very detailed issue about Kierkegaard's interpretation of ancient Greece, but it's quite brilliant. Um, so the ethical phase is, first of all, not something most people are actually in. Uh, and secondly, it's something you can't naturally be inside of. You have to attain the ethical phase. So the aesthetic phase is something you can find yourself in. And in fact, it's something you always find yourself in. The ethical phase is not something you can find yourself in. It's something you bind yourself into. So the ethical phase, in contrast to the aesthetic phase, is an achievement. The ethical phase, in contrast to the aesthetic phase, is the result of genuine decision. And it has a lot to do with decision. So the first claim is most humans are not in the ethical phase. The second claim is the ethical phase, the ethical stage of life, is an achievement connected to the free exercise of your will. And the third claim or phase, you could say, of my presentation today is from these prior two claims, the following result. You will systematically misinterpret Kierkegaard's writings if you don't understand the perspective of the pseudonymous authors with respect to the ethical phase. This is an extremely important claim. And said differently, the third claim is the ethical phase and the perspective of the pseudonymous writers and Kierkegaard's authorship. The ethical phase and the perspective of the pseudonymous writers is often the key subject matter of some of Kierkegaard's most famous texts. So, for example, Religiousness A and the transition to Religiousness B, the subdivision, as we'll see, of the two religious stages, are connected to their relationship to the ethical stage. And Religiousness A is inseparable from having achieved the ethical stage. So let me give you an example going backwards from these three claims of their importance. And each will illuminate. So it'll be chiastic. I sort of did one, two, three, and now I'm going to go three, two, one as I develop these in the rest of the lecture. So let's take this third claim I made and we'll make it the beginning of the body of the lecture, which is if you don't understand the ethical phase and pseudonymous um, writers' perspectives on it and towards it or in it, you will systematically misinterpret Kierkegaard's pseudonymous authorship. 
So what's the most famous example of such misinterpretation? Fear and Trembling. Fear and Trembling is a book that should not be read by people who have never read anything else by Kierkegaard. I, I'm not saying if you've read it and had a good experience that that's bad. What I mean is as a teacher, assigning Fear and Trembling is like teaching algebra when you haven't taught arithmetic. Your students will not understand it. And if you get students who think they do understand it, they will certainly be wrong. And the more intelligent the student is, the more, you know, interestingly intellectual their wrongness will be, but it'll be mathematically irrelevant. It won't be algebra. Uh, and, and there are brilliant people. I'm not going to name them because some of them are very distinguished people I admire very much, um, uh, who have proposed interpretations of Kierkegaard based on fear and trembling alone. And that method itself is fatally flawed. It goes explicitly against what Kierkegaard says. And it is a gross error hermeneutically because you cannot interpret the Kierkegaardian authorship apart from the theory of stages. And that's why I said it's very complicated because you not only have to understand the whole theory of stages, but you have to understand each of the stages, of course, to understand the theory of stages. If you don't understand the theory of stages and how they work, you can't then understand the authorship. Now you say, Sam, how do you understand the theory of stages? You have to read the pseudonymous authorship, preferably in chronological order, which is how I first read it when I systematically studied Kierkegaard. As I read the pseudonymous, pseudonymous authorship, starting with Kierkegaard's dissertation, and I read it chronologically. And that was what my mentor, um, Craig Hinkson, taught me to do. And Craig Hinkson had been friends with the Hongs and had spent three years as a Kierkegaard scholar in Denmark and was fluent in Danish read the Danish texts, and he was the one who taught me, you have to know the German tradition, you have to know German idealism and Luther, and you really need to read Kierkegaard in the right order. Um, obviously, you can't often make students do that, but if you're going to study Kierkegaard systematically, that's why I mentioned this in the beginning of the course. You really want to read the pseudonymous authorship chronologically because that's the best way to get a sense of how the stages are developing. Okay, so now let me say a bit more about the ethical phase in Fear and Trembling. Fear and Trembling is about the ethical phase in relationship to the religious stage. Therefore, the book is not meant to be understood by people who are in the aesthetic phase. So in contemporary academia, our only concept of so-called esoteric writing is immediately um, the Straussian context. We don't have any other context. And that's a real shame because whatever you think of Strauss, and I don't think very much of Strauss as a philosopher, although I admire him as an interpreter of concepts and of texts. Um, I think as a philosopher, he's a very bad philosopher. As an interpreter of texts, he's very interesting and very Heideggerian in the worst and best senses. The worst senses being absolutely historically insanely violent, um, implausible readings of text to serve his own interests, and in the best case, extremely profound insights into some of the concerns of texts that are almost never considered in other interpretive traditions. Um, and then a very close attention to the original languages, you know, is something very impressive about the Straussians of modern academia. But Modern academics don't understand Kierkegaard very well because Kierkegaard is working with a conception of interpretation that's already so much more complicated because it's platonic. And Strauss never really understood Plato. Um, it's platonic. And in a platonic conception, there is no rigorous distinction between esoteric and esoteric writing. To think there's such a distinction is so moronic. It shows a person hasn't understood what Plato thought about writing, which is writing can't be esoteric in any normal sense. Writing itself is always an act of deception and illusion. And the question is how much the author is complicit in the deception and the illusion. This is why if you read Kierkegaard's late work on my point of view as an author, where he talks himself about what he was doing in the pseudonymous authorship, he talks about deceiving people into the truth. He uses this paradoxical formulation. And this is because he understands what he's doing as indirect communication. And his theory of indirect communication is linked to his understanding of the limitations of direct communication, particularly writing. And his understanding of the limits of direct communication are, you could say, his own intellectual and spiritual development of a long tradition of reflection, but notably on the thought of Plato about writing. So the fear and trembling text is 
is in a context where specifically you need to understand the ethical phase and how the ethical phase looks to people who are in the ethical phase and what it looks like to people who are in the religious crisis, which is what the text is about. So that's the first um, big example. Now I'll take the example of fear and trembling and I'll transition to the issue that I said was the second point, which is that most um, people who, who aren't in the ethical phase, if you're going to achieve the ethical phase, you have to achieve it by actually choosing. You have to have a real decision, and we'll discuss briefly what that is in this section. And the real decision is what constitutes the ethical phase as a crisis in the existence of the human, whereas the aesthetic phase is that in which the human experiences the crisis. So the ethical phase is identified, as I mentioned briefly, with the universal and the communicable. So I'm going to repeat something I mentioned in the last lecture, but I'm going to say it now from a different perspective. If you want to be very concise, you have to be able to do isomorphic kind of identity comparisons in philosophy. Like, for example, in Plato, I teach my students good equals beautiful, equals true, equals being. This is a very important fundamental isomorphism. If you understand this, you have profound insight into Plato's text that people who study Plato for years and read all this ancient languages and scholarship lack simply a basic fundamental conceptual insight into the actual metaphysical structure of Plato's text. But this is an axiomatic meaning of the term Platonism or Platonic philosophy, is the identity of the good, the true, the beautiful, and reality. So in Kierkegaard, there's a similar set of not identities, but of parallels. So if you ask conceptually on the individual, universal, and particular spectrum, the individual for Kierkegaard is the highest, the universal is how the individual is achieved, and the particular is that through which the universal comes into being. In terms of the theory of phases, these therefore represent the aesthetic phase, correlates to the particular, not the individual, the particular. The ethical phase correlates to the universal, and the religious phase or stage correlates to the eternal, and it's the eternal that in this case on our scheme brings into being uh, the individual. So therefore, temporally, going backwards, the individual correlates with eternity, the universal correlates with time, temporality, and the aesthetic phase, the particular, correlates with a refusal of both time and eternity. So the reason that you find yourself in the aesthetic and you have to achieve the ethical at a very profound metaphysical level, at the level of the grammar of existence that Kierkegaard is seeking to enact and articulate so that a person can understand it by inhabiting it through a narrator and then understanding concepts through that narrator's perspective so that the double movement of both seeing through someone's eyes narratively through a perspective of an author and seeing what they see can open up a new space in yourself to form a new kind of self-concept that itself then can then use concepts at a more accurate, profound level. So the aesthetic person cannot understand Abraham at all. They, they will simply see Abraham as viciously immoral, which is, a, which is a fairly reasonable reading, of course, of a text about, say, child sacrifice. Um, but the point is that will be a dismissal because the aesthetic person doesn't actually care about morality at all. Their own life is not bound by any universal norm. They're not serving any universal norm, and there's no universal commitment that they're always going to uphold in their life. And so when they dismiss the text of Abraham or the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, when they dismiss that text as immoral, they're using a word that an ethical person would use with a lot of weight, but they're using it dismissively as a way of simply being, I don't really want to engage this text, or this text means nothing to me, or this text just shows that morality is nonsense or that religion is nonsense. So fear and trembling is not written for the aesthetic phase. And if you understand the dialectical development of the pseudonyms up to Johannes Silencio, you'll know why that's the case. But Johannes Silencio, John, Silent John is the name in Latin uh, of the pseudonym who writes fear and trembling. Johannes de Silencio, or John of Silence more literally, um, comes out of a perspective that's seeking to understand religion through Abraham. 
And it's seeking to understand religion through Abraham through, now here's a very important point, the way that the universal was understood by the most important philosopher at Kierkegaard's time, in, in Kierkegaard's mind, which is Hegel, but broadly German idealism, so particularly the Kantian tradition, but specifically Hegel. So the ethical phase for Kierkegaard does indeed have a great deal to do with Hegel's idea of the Zittlich, which we translate as ethical, although Zittlichkeit in German or Zittlich is it's comparable to older terms like mores or customs um, in Greek and Latin. Customs in Greek is nomoi, but that's also the same word we translate as law. And the reason for that is because law arises from custom. And so a rigorous distinction between law and custom only occurs when you get written legal traditions and you only get enacted written legal traditions that govern societies, it seems to be, at least that we can tell after the rise of alphabetic literacy, um, and particularly, for example, Solon's Code, and then the development of legal theory after Plato's laws becomes much more what we think of as modern legal written juristic jurisprudence. But historically, legal codes were not even always abided by in a strict sense. And this is something well known to scholars of ancient Near Eastern law, in which texts like the Code of Hammurabi, for example, are known to have been respected in societies that seem to have systematically ignored their teaching. So the meaning of law in ancient Mediterranean, ancient Near Eastern society seems to evolve. And the way we understand law as a very strictly written and strictly enforced or abided by um, legal um, force in society, this itself is a historical development. So Hegel's idea of the Zitlish has to do with that complexity of the relationship between the customs of a people, the way they behave, feel, and live, and the normative self-articulation of that people. And so if you're going to have a deep understanding of Kierkegaard's idea of the ethical, you do absolutely need to understand Hegel's idea of the ethical because Kierkegaard is engaging that. And so in Fear and Trebling, what's happening is, is you're getting a particular perspective a broadly Hegelian perspective on the religious life. So it's as if a Hegelian German idealist um, of a particular caste was looking at uh, the Akedah, the story of the binding of Isaac in Genesis. And that fact is very significant because we rightly know Fear and Trembling is a great text. Kierkegaard famously said after he wrote it, this text alone will make me immortal. I mean, he knew it was a work of immortal genius, and it is. Um, one of the most harrowing and profound studies of the subject of the Binding of Isaac by the Harvard professor John Levinson, um, I think it's called The Death and Resurrection of the Beloved Son, you know, he engages Kierkegaard. So, I mean, even the most rigorous biblical historical scholars respect Kierkegaard's reading enough and its influence to engage this reading of this text. So it's very important, actually, what I'm saying to recognize this is actually quite radical thing. And, um, you know, I've written about this. I'm going to present this in more detail in the audio course I'm going to do on Kierkegaard. And that audio course will be a beginning. I'll eventually want to do a kind of lecture or mini course on each of Kierkegaard's pseudonymous works. That's going to take me some time. But for those of you who really want to follow me into Kierkegaardian territory, this free course is the first part. The paid audio course will be the second part. And then for those who want to study with me personally, the prerequisite will be you've taken the audio course. And then from that, you, you could study with me. And I'm going to start teaching some Kierkegaard seminars every year on some of his famous texts. But those seminars will be closed to anyone who hasn't done the prerequisite work. Because as you can see, there's actually a lot going on in Kierkegaard's work. And this free series is designed to give, I hope, a ton of value to the general public but also to set up a foundation for people who want to do very serious work on Kierkegaard and want to understand his relevance for philosophy, theology, their life, whatever it may be. So if, let's review where we're at. We had three major claims about the ethical phase. The first is most people aren't in it. The second is that it's an achievement. It's the result somehow of a kind of peculiarly strong sense of a free decision or choice, whatever that may mean. And the third was that without an understanding of the ethical phase in a pseudonymous author's relationship to it, we can't come to a good understanding of Kierkegaard's pseudonymous writings. And my famous example then, working backwards from that, was Fear and Trembling. Fear and Trembling is about the relationship between the religious phase to the perception of a person in the ethical phase, or a person who's trying to think the religious phase 
from the standpoint of the ethical phase. And um, I have a much more specific reading of Fear and Trembling I'm going to give in the audio course. And that has to do with, uh, you know, a very interesting tradition to do with Grimm's fairy stories, which I believe following a, a very important old German scholar, but who's not much known today, I believe that this particular um, Grimm story is very important. So you could, yeah, that's a hint for those of you who want to look that up. But there's a fairy story um, that is, I think, unquestionably influencing the choice of this name, not just the sort of Christian historical point. So anyway, that's just part of the, there's a lot more details about the character individually, the pseudonym. So I'm giving you a very general characterization of the pseudonymous author's perspective, merely to illustrate the theory of stages, not to provide a detailed interpretation of the pseudonymous author and persona, Johannes de Silencio, author of Fear and Trembling, published by Sir Anne Kierkegaard. Because that's how Kierkegaard wanted it. He said, please do not attribute the pseudonyms to me. So when people say Kierkegaard said and they're quoting a synonymous book, they are expressly contradicting what he asked of them. And maybe they don't know that, but then that would be a good reason to be humble and realize if you haven't read the relevant material you should restrict your claims um, and make them non-historical. You can say, this is my understanding, but I'm not saying it's Kierkegaard's. That's the simplest way to just be humble. We can still have an insight into a text. We just need to not say that is an insight historically into what the author was doing or what the text is saying. It's what we got out of it. And that's not the same thing as what a responsible interpretation of a text that passes itself off as a historical critical reading of the text in its historical philosophical context is. And I think we need historical readings of texts. Otherwise, we can just make up whatever we want. And a lot of contemporary philosophers and historical philosophers have done that. And so I'm very um, critical of attempts to elide the distinction between a reading of what an author is saying in a text and a presentation of what a current philosopher wants a text to mean for their purposes. Uh, we want texts to do lots of things for us in the academia, and often those things may have little to do with the author's purpose or the original meaning or the proper understanding of the text. That's legitimate as long as you make the distinction. Those of you who've watched my lecture on historical method in the Heidegger series, um, I would refer you to that again if you haven't seen it or as a refresher for the importance of this in the practice of philosophy. So what does this then have to do with a decision? Well, let's again take fear and trembling. Um, the crisis in fear and trembling, as Kierkegaard presents it, has to do with the will of Abraham. So first of all, that's a pretty clear indication, right? We're dealing here with a post-aesthetic reality. So Kierkegaard's presentation of the binding of Isaac, of course, has to do with the crisis, four different tellings of the crisis of God's command to Abraham with respect to his beloved son, Isaac. So the will is also what's essential in the first emergence in the pseudonymous authorship and chronologically of a detailed exposition of the ethical phase, which is Judge Wilhelm in part two of Either Or. Judge Wilhelm of part two and Either Or presents the ethical life in terms of the concrete image of marriage, which I mentioned in my last lecture, and that contrasts with a concrete image of seduction. So each phase has a mode of handling the erotic. Um, the aesthetic handles the erotic under the aspect of seduction. The ethical handles the erotic uh, under, you could say, the sublimated form of marriage where the erotic can have a free life, as Judge Wilhelm would see it, a life that orders the world and fulfills desire but isn't destructive in the process and therefore leads to the values that all humans actually do share. So in Kierkegaard's view, the marriage as an institution in the philosophical sense is linked to universality, and thus the ethical phase is connected to the universal, and it's illustrating the universal through the marriage institution. And the marriage institution is the concrete embodiment of the most significant fact that Kierkegaard is trying to help people understand about the ethical phase. And this is why Judge Wilhelm's letters are primarily these kind of very amusing, very profound. He's a wonderful character. I just love him as a literary character. Letters to his young compatriot about marriage and about why he thinks this life is worth living. So Judge Wilhelm is defending marriage as a sort of philosophical way of life. 
Uh, of course, if you know Kierkegaard's famous bio biography, you might think that's strange, but I think Kierkegaard understood what marriage could mean in a very deep way, regardless of what you think about his personal relationship to it. And for Kierkegaard, like for many old traditions, marriage isn't fundamentally a description of the way human beings treat each other under the name of the institution. It's a description of the conceptual truth and reality that's emerging into history through the philosophical interpretation of what marriage actually means. And there, marriage becomes very important, regardless of whether you're single or always want to be single or, you know, have a hundred partners or whatever, that doesn't matter. As a philosopher, all of those different people would still be interested in marriage in this Kierkegaardian sense. So now I said marriage is this distillation of what? A elective universal. So this is the meaning of the ethical phase in a nutshell. The ethical phase has to do with elective universality. So elective universality means you choose marriage. But marriage, so you can't be married if you don't choose. So Kierkegaard has a very modern romantic conception of marriage, right? Legally, um, there was no choice in marriage. In traditional societies, still, there's not as much choice. If In Indian society, for example, it's still customary to, let's just say, rely heavily on the consultation and advice of one's parents in the selection of a spouse, so I'm not saying there's no agency or I'm not even commenting in any sense or making a judgment. I'm just pointing out Indian society today, including in the upper classes, um, is much more like what marriage has been like historically, which is it heavily involves the, the houses from which the two people are marrying. It's a radically modern idea that you don't see depicted with any social power and amusing sort of elegant force until Jane Austen's novels. It's a very radical idea to treat marriage as a elective institution in which two people elect based on their understandings of love to form a union. That's not historically what marriage was as an institution, not at all. You can just read the Bible and see how unlike that uh, marriage is. Um, Isaac and um, Sarah and Abraham have a very weird marriage from a modern perspective, but a very more or less not implausible marriage from an ancient Near Eastern perspective in which owning women was, of course, the legal norm, and owning slaves was the legal norm, and all of these other things. So marriage historically has been part of the history of chattel slavery. That's the real legal um, relevant category to interpret the historical institution of marriage. And modern marriage is the great revolution that builds on the Christian medieval tradition of romantic love, and then, you know, has basically only lasted about 150 years, and maybe he's going out of existence again. But Kierkegaard thought it was very important philosophically as did Hegel and a lot of other thinkers who had very, let's say, tempestuous romantic lives, like Schelling, for example. Um, so the elective universality means you choose something that is then forever binding. In other words, it is in that sense universal across the time and space of all the rest of your life. You are making a choice and a vow to bind yourself to a concrete meaning of your existence. And the concrete meaning of your existence is embodied by the way in which you constitute a new form of your identity in relationship to another free person forever. So the ethical in this sense is where you get the first glimmer of the eternal. So even though I said ethical correlates with time, someone could critique me and say, just look at Judge Wilhelm. I do know that. Um, but what that'll have to do with is the word eternal is used in the ethical phase because it correlates with the universal, the always and forever binding. Um, but there's a much more specific proper meaning of the eternal that is unique to the religious phase. And in point of fact, the ethical phase concept of, of eternality is much more linked to what I would say is a positive concept of time or a positive concept of infinity. It's a sort of negation or contrast with what Hegel calls, um, I think he was the die Böse Unendlichkeit, the bad infinite. Um, so, but that's neither here nor there. That's a quite technical issue. It doesn't affect this. So this is the second claim then, that you have to choose the ethical. The model for choosing the ethical is marriage and this specific understanding of a choice you make that binds you concretely to a way of life that you can't make by yourself, but that you make in recognition of and through being recognized by another free person making the same decision towards you. So this is a very radical thing, and you can see why now maybe it makes sense to realize most people never enter the ethical phase.
and Kierkegaard thinks that's the case. Now, here's the big kicker, and I'll conclude my lecture now on the first claim, which is most people aren't in the ethical phase. As you can see, I hope a pretty seamless movement back to this claim. Why? Because most people aren't selves. So if you read the beginning of Kierkegaard's really great work written under the Antiklimacus pseudonym, part of the three great 1948 works, 1948-49 works, The Sickness Unto Death, which is kind of my original Kierkegaardian expertise, um, the beginning of The Sickness Unto Death talks about three different kind of relative ways of being, one of which isn't even yet to be a self. So there's a form of despair that isn't even really despair. It's not even really to have a self. It's not really despair because you're not really a self. And only a real self can despair. So the 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 kind of not really real self that doesn't really despair but lives as a type of despair, that's the, eth the aesthetic phase. And then the first form of genuine despair emerges only when a person becomes a self. And for Kierkegaard, and here Kierkegaard is profoundly engaged with the thought of a Johann Georg Fichte, or Fichte, some people say, and Hegel, but I think Fichte or Fichte is really important for Hegel's, for Kierkegaard's concept of uh, the ethical. Because Fichte, and I can't go into this, if you don't know anything about it, you can read one of my articles called From Jena to Copenhagen about Kierkegaard and Fichte, but I, I'm going to do a lot more work on that in my subsequent courses. Um, Fichte understands the ethical and the voluntary to be essentially linked which of course we know that you're not a good person except in terms of how you use your will that's the kind of modern german idealist view that your will is what determines your ethical value not happenstance like you happen to be born with good habits and nice parents so you're a kind of nice seeming person that's not an ethical person by the rigorous german idealist conception an ethical person is ethical because of the way they use their will and this is very Kantian, ultimately it's very Augustinian position. It's a very profound development of things from Latin antiquity and then the Christian philosophical tradition. So Kierkegaard is very engaged in the German idealist debates as a kind of Danish German idealist, if you will. And so the reason most people aren't in the ethical phase is because most people don't have a way of life that they have consciously chosen and decided to make their binding way of life through a free recognition of another person. Uh, and that's obvious. So I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just telling you, it's actually, once you understand the ethical phase, you understand a ton about Kierkegaard. And the ethical phase is the beginning of really understanding the theory of stages. Because when you understand the theory of stages through the ethical phase, you at least understand, oh, okay, most of us aren't selves yet. Um, a, the self is a project, and most people haven't begun the project. The ethical phase is the beginning of the project of the self. There is currently this, I don't want to be critical, but there's this, I find, infantile fashion in publishing now about self-making, self-creation. You know, in a way, this began amongst people who didn't understand these concepts with Greenblatt's Renaissance self-fashioning, which made his career when he was a young scholar. So people have been misusing or using this language in this kind of absurdly broad metaphorical way in publishing for a while, but now we have a slew of books talking about self-fashioning, self-creation, blah, blah, blah. And that's because the philosophical ideas are now 200 years developed in our culture, and that's why they're in, you know, Kennedy's um, uh, um, opinion. If you read Obergefell versus Hodges, you know, that is the, the Supreme Court. You can find it in legal institutions, the Supreme Court, in that sense, you can find it in publishing everywhere now. People are writing books with these titles. It's a trend now. But the philosophical concept of self-creation is extremely profound and complicated, and it emerges in the way that we're beginning to experience it at a mass cultural level about 200, you know, 15, 20 years ago with Kant's philosophy, Rousseau's philosophy. And there's a big tradition about that. That's what my sort of biggish academic book is going to be about a lot of that, how that concept emerges. So the aesthetic phase is the phase in which you find yourself. Literally, for good or bad, maybe you don't ever find yourself, but it's where you happen to be when you just start thinking about yourself. And that's fine, right? That's completely fine. The aesthetic phase, in one sense, is preserved in the ethical phase, everything good about it. But from the standpoint of selfhood, a person who's never even thought, what am I as a human being, obviously hasn't committed to a particular way of life. So as I'll explain in my audio course, the ethical phase correlates also with 
the philosophical life um, in a very deep sense. So this is just, I hope, a very, I hope, informative. I think I was able to do a fair amount in about a half hour or so. But I know it's a lot of material. It's lectures here. It's free. You can listen to it as much as you want. And I hope, uh, in connection with the prior lecture, uh, it's illuminating. And it, it was, I hope, worth the wait. The next lecture will come very soon in a week or so. And I'll wrap up this free course uh, in the next month. Uh, my name is Samuel Longcar. I'm the founder and creator of the Becoming Human Project. I'm the editor of the Marginalia Review of Books. I'm a philosopher and historian of um, science and religion. And this is my channel. I thank you very much for joining me. I'd ask that you like the video if you appreciated it, share it with your friends, and support my work. Thanks very much.